Thank you for listening to this recent message from the Rescue Church. We pray that God will use this message to encourage, challenge, and inspire you on your faith journey. If you'd like to learn more about the Rescue Church, please visit us online at therescuechurch.com. Well, hey, good morning, Rescue Church. Welcome each and every one of you in all of our different locations. Say, I just want to tell you, um, I could really use your prayer right now because as you're watching this message today, at this moment, I am down in Henderson, Nebraska, preaching at a church. Uh, I've been invited to come and speak about their desire to go multi site and to reach not just their one community, but an entire region around where this little church is at. And they've asked me to come and share the story of the Rescue Church and what God has done in our church, being one church meeting in multiple places with a vision and a heart to bring the gospel to rural communities. So thank you for being a part of the story, and uh, thank you for letting me be your pastor who gets to go share that today. Uh, But I've got something that I am pumped to share with you all this morning as we look into God's Word in John chapter 4. I want to start by just sharing a little story with you, and it's kind of a confession because you all are going to laugh at me and call me uh, an old person, Uh, but I'm just going to be honest, and I don't care if you laugh. I like putting jigsaw puzzles together. Does anyone else like doing that? Um, Some people hate it. Some of you think I should be in a nursing home because I just admitted that. But I do. I like taking a thousand-piece jigsaw puzzle, and uh, especially in the cold winter months where there's really nothing else to do outside. And just, I love putting on music in the background or an audio book, and then just sitting there and letting my mind figure out how to put a puzzle together. I enjoy that. And uh, this last week, my, my youngest son, James, and I were doing that on Sunday. I think it was on last Sunday or Monday, but either way, like we had better than music and better than an audio book. We had the soothing sounds of a football game playing on the TV in the background. And uh, again, laugh at me if you want. There's just something that's medicating about the sound of a a roaring crowd and the commentators, and I don't even care who was playing. We just were putting a puzzle together, football's going in the background, and I'm just relaxing. I'm in the best place. Like, this is fun. I'm relaxing. But then my son James said something to me that is really could preach an entire sermon. Sometimes kids come up with just the greatest statements that you're like, wow, that's more true than you even realize. So I'm sitting in one place, looking at this puzzle, kind of working with the pieces. My, my son James, who doesn't you know, sit as well as I do, he's kind of just buzzing around the table, making circles, and working on the puzzle from every different angle. And he made a statement. He said, Dad, when you move to different parts of the table you see things that you did not see before. Is that not profound or what? That's, that's a sermon in itself right there. I said, yeah, son, that's called perspective. Sometimes when we get up and move to a different area, sometimes when we change our perspective, we're going to see something in a new way that's been there all along, but we're going to have a different angle, a different perspective to see that thing from. And here's what I want you to know. Today, as we finish up John chapter 4, I think we're finishing 4. Maybe not. Maybe we still have a few more verses in chapter 4. As we continue in John chapter 4, what I want you to know is my prayer for the people of this church is that God would open your eyes in a fresh way with a fresh perspective, not to a new truth, but to a truth that's been there all along, you just maybe haven't seen it or maybe you haven't seen it in a long time from the angle that God is going to show it to you today. I'm praying that we get some perspective on some things that God would want us to see. As a matter of fact, the title of this message today is simply, Open Your Eyes. We're going to hear Jesus say that to his disciples in John chapter 4. By way of review, before I start reading in John chapter 4, Here's the story. Jesus is traveling with his disciples. They're going from Judea down in the southern part of Palestine. They're going up to Galilee in the north, and they are passing through Samaria. They're going through a route that most Jews would not have taken because they hated the Samaritans, but Jesus said he's got to go through it. And he's, he's going through this place that most Jews would avoid, and he comes to the town of Sychar. He's tired from the journey. He sits down at a well. The disciples leave to go into town to get some food, and while Jesus is there, this woman comes out to get water in the hottest part of the day. 
And Jesus engages her in a conversation. He asks her, hey, would you draw some water for me? And she's like, why are you talking to me? You're a Jew. I'm a Samaritan. I'm a woman. You're a man. I have a shameful past. Like, there's so many reasons you should not even be talking to me right now. I'm paraphrasing, right? She didn't say it all in those exact words. That's not a direct quote. But we see the heart of a God in heaven who is willing to break down those racial barriers and those social barriers and the shameful past that would keep us hidden behind walls. He breaks down those walls to bring this offer of living water to this woman. And that's what we've been looking at these last few weeks. We're going to pick up the story in John chapter 4, verse 27. This woman is starting to come to a realization that she is actually speaking to someone who claims to be the Messiah. That's where we left off last week. Jesus told her, man, if you knew who you were talking to, I am the one. I am the Messiah. I'm speaking to you right now. We're going to pick up the story in verse 27. It says, just then his disciples returned and were surprised to find him talking with the woman. But no one asked, what do you want or why are you talking with her? Again, I'm not going to belabor this point. We've, we've really done a good job in the last two weeks unpacking this. But just a reminder, there's these barriers that would keep most Jewish men from ever even talking to this woman. There's the racial hatred. There's the social aspect of the fact that he's a man, she's a woman, and, and she's a woman with a shameful past. And the disciples come back from their little grocery run, and they're like, um, why is he talking to her? But, but they, they didn't want to ask him out loud. Maybe up to this point, they have already learned that, man, Jesus does some things differently than how anyone else would do them. He approaches things differently. Maybe they were just too afraid to ask, but for whatever reason, they're just probably, you can imagine them just kind of looking at each other like, why is he talking to her? What's happening here? Well, let's keep on reading. Verse 28, the, the story continues. It says, then, and if you've got your notes out, I want you to underline this phrase, or if you've got your Bible open, underline the phrase, leaving her water jar. Then, leaving her water jar, the woman went back to the town and said to the people, come, see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Messiah? They came out of the town and made their way toward him. Notice where she's at in her faith journey, by the way. She still isn't 100% certain of who Jesus is, but now she's starting to question, is this really the Messiah? Could he be the one? But I had you underline that detail. For whatever reason, John thought it was important for us to know that this woman left her water jar in order to go back into the town to invite people to come and meet Jesus. I think that detail is significant for two reasons. The one, reaching back to the messages from the past two weeks, where we unpack this metaphor or this word picture that Jesus used regarding that well. He's basically saying to this woman, look, you've been coming back to this well, in this case, this well that doesn't satisfy your longing and does not quench your thirst. It's, it's a well of relationships, where you keep believing that the next relationship with the next man will satisfy the desires of your heart and you keep coming back empty. Remember, we unpacked that in the last two weeks. She's basically, by leaving that water jar behind, it's kind of symbolic that you can understand she is turning away from that water vessel, that broken water pot that does not hold water to satisfy and again, we're speaking metaphorically here, not about physical water, because we still all need physical water to live. We understand that, right? But I think there's a turning in this. I think this is evidence that she's turning away from her sinful lifestyle, her sinful past, and she's leaving that behind. Here's another significant thing more in the real world. The fact that she left her water jar behind implies what? That she had every intention of coming back to where Christ was. She wasn't going to just abandon her water jar because she still needed to go to a physical well to draw physical water. So she went to tell other people about Christ and then she was coming back to Christ. Even though she didn't have it all figured out about who he was yet, there was something about this relationship with Christ that was drawing her back. She had every intention and plan of coming back to the Lord. Here's what I want to say. I believe this weekend I'm speaking to some people that you continue to be drawn back to the things of the Lord. 
Maybe it's even through this church, and maybe you find yourself saying, man, I love going to the church. I love the music that they play at the Rescue Church. Or I love, I love the preaching. I, I love how Pastor John or, or my campus pastor preaches the word. And I want to tell you, thank you for that. We're glad that you keep coming back. But I need to tell you there's more going on than you probably realize. You're not coming back because you like the music or because you find the preaching to be engaging and, and, and a step above other preaching. I'm just joking. Like That's not why you keep coming back. What keeps drawing you back is the Lord Jesus Christ himself. There's something irresistible that keeps you coming back. And even though you maybe don't have it all figured out, and maybe even though you're not so sure that you're ready to become a Christian or a Christ follower, there's still something that has you coming back. Because the love of Christ draws us in. I think that's what we see happening with this woman. She had every intention of returning back to Christ. But check this out. She also felt this compelling response Because of this interaction she had with Jesus, I need to go share this with others and invite others to come back. So check it out. Even if you are not yet a Christ follower, even if you don't have all of this stuff figured out, which, by the way, neither do I. But even if you're like, I don't even know. I've never even read the whole Bible. I've got so many questions, more than I have answers to. Here's what I want you to know is that you still can share Christ with others. And you can invite people to be introduced to as much about Christ as you know to share. I think once we've had a real encounter with Christ, we feel a compulsion to share Christ with others in our life. We maybe feel scared by it, we feel intimidated about it, but there's something that compels us. When I meet someone who claims to have had an encounter with Christ and there's zero evidence in their life, that they desire on some level to share Jesus with other people, I'm just being honest. I strongly question their encounter with Christ. Because in the the Bible, when we see people coming face to face with the Lord Jesus Christ, the next step is they're going and telling other people about it. Even times where Jesus is like, shh, shh, don't tell anybody. They can't help themselves. They go share what they know about Christ. So anyway, that's a cool detail of the story. But then, check it out. She's leaving She's going to the town. Imagine in your mind there's townspeople are starting to come out toward the well. We're going to get to them in just a moment. But now she exits the stage and it leaves Jesus and his disciples. Let's watch this story continue, okay? It says, verse 31, Meanwhile, his disciples urged him, Rabbi, eat something. But he said to them, watch this. This is weird. He says, I have food to eat that you know nothing about. Then his disciples said to each other, Could someone have brought him food? And then look at Jesus' response. He says, my food, said Jesus, is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. The disciples just got done going on a grocery run for the Lord. They came back, hey, Jesus, here's your food, eat something. And now Jesus says, hey, guys, I'm, I'm good. I've got food that you don't even know anything about. You don't know nothing about the food that I've got. And they're probably looking at each other going, did Jesus like squirrel away a granola bar in his robe and brought it with him? Or did a food truck stop by while we were gone? Like, what's this food? Who fed Jesus? But question, church, was Jesus talking about physical food? No, once again, Jesus is speaking in a metaphorical term. And what he's essentially teaching his disciples is this, hey guys, There's something in life that's even more important and more fulfilling than physical food itself. And and just stop and think about the implications of that, because we would all agree physical food is pretty important. Yes, we would all agree. Without it, we die. And uh, it's also pretty fulfilling. Yes, would we all agree that when we do not have physical food, we feel empty and we feel unfulfilled? We feel like this is an important thing. I need to pursue getting food in my body. And Jesus is saying, you know what, guys? There's something in this world that's even more important and more fulfilling than physical food. And do you want to know what it is, guys? It's when I do the work of my Father who sent me, I get fulfillment on a level that food can't even begin to touch. Now, this is just a weird detail I'm going to share with you. Don't take this as prescriptive. I'm not saying that this has to be true for your life. This is just a descriptive 
thing that I'm sharing, just a little bit of evidence from my own life where I can say, I, I get what Jesus is saying here. Small story. Like, when on Sundays, you might, the fun fact, you might not care about this, but I'll just share a little behind the scenes peek into Pastor John's world. On a normal Sunday morning, when it's my privilege and my delight to get to come to God's house and preach the Word of God, because I feel like I might not be gifted at much in life, but I feel like when I do that, I really feel like I'm doing something that God has put me here to do and gifted me to do. Do you realize most Sunday mornings I wake up and I don't even want to eat? Because I'm excited, I'm a little bit nervous, and I don't want to preach on a stomach full of food, and I can't explain it. And when church is done, it's not like I don't want to go eat food. Believe me, I do, and believe me, I get plenty to eat, okay? But, but there's like this period of time where it's like, I don't even need food right now. I don't even want food. Because I'm, it's like I'm feeling this fulfillment and satisfaction from doing the work that the Father has put me here to do. All I'm saying is I get what Jesus is saying. Jesus is saying is that, I'll put it in different words. Let me package it this way. I'm speaking to Christians who you are maybe in the habit of coming to church and hearing God's word. That's a good thing. Good job, church. Way to go. I'm glad you're in God's house this morning. Uh, some of you need to do a better job than others, but if you're here, I'm probably preaching to the choir right now, okay? What you're doing is nourishing. You're getting food, spiritual food, that's being served up by a spiritual leader, right? You get nourishment by being in church. I'm speaking to Christians that some of you are in a regular habit or pretty consistent habit of opening the Word of God and reading God's Word into your life. That's a good thing. That's nourishment. Okay? And you need to keep doing that. That's important. I'm speaking to some Christians here today that you love Bible studies. Man, you love the next Bible study. You can't wait to get together with your small group. And, and you would say, man, we need more of that. We need more Bible studies. I'm, I'm not, I'm not an anti-Bible study guy. I think Bible studies are important. But let me tell you something. If that's all you're getting, can I just tell you, you are a malnourished Christian. You're still empty. Because deep down, true spiritual nourishment is found when we do the work that God has put us here to do when we serve there's a nourishment and a feeding that comes, a fulfillment. As a matter of fact, I'll just give you three words if you want to write these down on your notes. They're not on the screen, but just three words that kind of popped into my head to describe what the spiritual nourishment feels like. Okay, so write down the word peace. Write down the word happiness. And write down the word power. Because when we do the work that God has put us here to do, when we get that nourishment, it's going to bring us to a place of peace where we just have this sense of, I'm doing what I was created to do. We're going to have a sense of happiness. Hey, Christians, can I tell you, it's not bad to be happy. I think it's okay. Everybody seeks happiness. But a lot of times we seek it in the wrong way. When we nourish ourselves by doing the work that God has put us here to do, there's fulfillment and happiness that comes from that. And then I gave you the word power. And you might be thinking, well, John, that doesn't sound like something I ought to say out loud that I want power. But I'm just here to tell you who wants to go through life without power? Who wants to go through life without being in control and without a sense that I have empowerment I think that we're created to desire that. And here's what I'm telling you is that when you are being nourished by doing the work that God has called you to do, you feel a sense of empowerment because the Spirit of God is giving me power to do stuff that I could not do in and of myself because I'm operating in an area of my strengths and giftedness. And it's satisfying. That's what Jesus is saying to his disciples, he didn't say, he's not saying I squirreled away a granola bar in my pocket or a food truck came and fed me physically. He's saying, hey guys, as important as physical food is, I'm so jacked up right now because I'm doing the very work that my father has called me here to do. I stopped at this well tired and weary from the journey and then I met a woman who was living behind the walls of these racial barriers and the walls of these social stigmas and the walls of a shameful, isolated past and I was just used by my Father in heaven to destroy those barriers and bring her face to face with the offer of eternal life. And I'm so jacked up on that right now, I don't even need your sandwich. That's what Jesus is saying. I know exactly what he's talking about. I'm pretty sure he probably had a physical meal at some point that day. 
But he's telling the disciples there's something more important. And I'm just saying, I, I believe I'm speaking to some Christians this morning in the Rescue Church that maybe one of the reasons that you feel kind of powerless and kind of unfulfilled and kind of a lack of peace in your life and, and, and just some dissatisfaction is maybe because you are searching for nourishment in a way you're never going to find it. You're not being nourished by doing the will that God has put you here to do. You're not in ministry. You're chasing so many other things that you're not actively using your gifts in the body of Christ to serve the church and to serve people beyond the church. And I would just contend, I know it sounds kind of counterproductive, like, wait a minute, you're telling me if I do work, I'll be nourished by that? I know it sounds kind of counterproductive, but that's what Jesus is saying is that when we do what God put us here to do, we will feel and experience nourishment and satisfaction that we never knew was possible. Little story for you. Um, this past Wednesday night, we had a meeting in our Flandreau campus to have a really important conversation about the need for us as the body of Christ to step up and carry the weight and serve in such a way that God has called and gifted us to serve like newsflash to the rescue church there is no single person in this church including the pastor who has every gift that the body of Christ needs I don't have every gift so as we met this last Wednesday night I basically shared with our Flandreau campus look I'm gifted in a few of these areas but when it comes to like shepherding and taking care of the needs in the body of Christ I don't do a very good job of that and I need your help and I need you to step up and carry that weight. And uh, as we were preparing for that meeting in our leadership team meeting this past week, one of my leaders asked this question, and it was just like from a point of discussion. It wasn't like an argumentative thing, but they just kind of were trying to put themselves in that meeting where we're calling the people of the church to step up and serve and do the work of the Father who's put us here and called us. And the question that they asked was, well, what if somebody kind of asks, what's in it for me? What do I get out of the deal? It's an interesting question, isn't it? What that question implies is that we live in a culture of consumeristic Christianity, where we treat the church like something that exists to serve ourselves, where we approach the body of Christ with this idea of what do I get? What's in it for me? Who's here to take care of me? What, what's it going to be for me? And my answer to the guys, and again, we all agreed, and it's so ironic, we're dealing with this very passage of Scripture the same week we're having this conversation. Jesus is saying, you want to know what you get out of the deal? You get nourishment. You get fed. You get to do the work of the Father who's put you here and called you and gifted you, and you get to be a part of life change. You get to be a part of having these conversations at the well. And in our world, the well might look like Starbucks. The well might look like the lunchroom table where you work or in the cafeteria at school and you get to have those conversations with the men and the women and the teenagers at the modern day well. And you get to be used by God to be a part of his mission of seeking and saving the lost and you will be so jacked up and nourished from that. That's what you get out of the deal. It's good stuff, man. Powerful stuff. Well, let's keep going. Next verse, Jesus continues talking to the disciples and he says this. We're, we're about to get into this theme of the harvest. Watch this. He says, don't you have a saying? It's still four months until harvest. I tell you, here's the phrase, underline this, open your eyes and look at the fields. They are ripe for harvest. Even now, the one who reaps draws a wage and harvests a crop for eternal life so that, underline this next phrase, the sower and the reaper may be glad together. Again, there's like there's this joy in getting to be a part of the harvest. Thus the saying, one sows and another reaps, is true. I sent you to reap what you have not worked for. Others have done the hard work and you have reaped the benefits of their labor. Catch your breath, church, because we got to pause here for just a minute. There's so much here. There's so much here and so much I want to share. Jesus, I, I, almost imagine, I almost imagine that at this point, the people from the town are starting to make their way out, and maybe the people are starting to gather on the horizon. And Jesus is getting ready to shift this conversation once again into another metaphor. 
Now he's going to talk about a harvest. And and in some of the commentaries that I read, they basically said because of the the clues that we have from the, the scripture, like the fact that it's very oppressive heat in the middle of the day, and the fact that there's a lack of water to where people have to come to this well to get water would indicate that there's not a physical harvest This is not a season of physical harvest. So Jesus isn't pointing to an actual field. I almost wonder if Jesus was not pointing to the people that were coming out from the town that would soon be gathered around Jesus and his disciples. And he says to his disciples, after getting done telling them that there is food and nourishment in doing the work of the Father who sent me, he says, guys, don't you see? Open your eyes and look at the fields. They're ripe for harvest. Don't tell me the harvest is coming down the road. It's here now. There's work to be done. Look around you. I want to tell you about someone that I recently became aware of. And uh, I'm going to describe his story the best I can Um, And maybe before I tell his story, I'm going to tell you just a a little bit of my context where I came from, because then when you understand my context, you'll you'll better understand why when I hear Cameron's story, it just, it's so hard for me to to grasp because it's not the world I grew up in. So I, I was blessed, not because of anything I did or any of my good works. I don't know why. I was blessed to be born into an intact family where there was a lot of love in the home. It was a Christ-centered family where from the youngest memory I have, I, I have been taught and led to know and obey and love Jesus, and I have experienced the love of Christ in my home through godly parents and through seeing a godly marriage modeled and through a healthy church family. And, and uh, well, growing up, our family was in no stretch of the imagination well-off or rich um, we, we, at the same time, never were in lack. Like, we, we never went without the basic needs being met. And I only share that with you so you understand that as I tell Cameron's story, you'll just go, okay, it's, it's a little different world from what I grew up in. Cameron's nine years old. And uh, at the age of nine, Cameron doesn't know who his dad is. He's never met his biological father. He, he'll never meet him. He'll never know who his real father in this world is he can't even put this into words church but there's a there's an a longing in his heart to hear a man speak into his life and just tell him Cameron I love you and I'm proud of you and he's never heard that from a man sadly he's not really even heard it from his mom because his mom and I'm not trying to make excuses for her bad behavior and, and poor decisions in life but his mom continues, I mean, his entire life, for all nine years of his life, all he has known of his mother is that she is a slave to addiction, to alcohol, and to drug abuse. And again, we could peel back the layers on that and look at her upbringing and all of the hurt and pain in her life, and we would understand that, well, yes, it's very destructive and it doesn't justify it. It's, it's her attempt to numb the pain in her way. And she surrounds herself with One bad man after another who has access not only to Cameron, but to multiple of his step-siblings. And so the abuse that he has seen verbally, physically, sexually, would break our hearts. And in his world, it's all he's ever known. And he can't even articulate why it's not okay. He just kind of assumes, I guess this is normal, but there's still something about it that doesn't feel right. He lives in a house that's full of people, people coming and going, and yet he experiences the reality of just extreme loneliness and isolation. In his house, there's a lot of struggle for necessities being met, and it's not that there are zero resources, it's just that the adults that get to make those decisions make very poor decisions, differentiating between feeding addiction and differentiating between needs versus wants. And so while there's cable TV and smartphones available in the home, there's very little food in the refrigerator or cupboards, and so Cameron deals on a regular basis with hunger. If it were not for school, If it were not for the early morning programs and the after school programs, Cameron would would eat very little of physical food. 
And the only thing worse than the daily physical hunger that he wrestles with is just the spiritual emptiness and isolation that he cannot even articulate and put into words. Cameron does not know that there's a God in heaven who sent his son Jesus to die on his behalf. Cameron does not know that there is a Savior who has the power to break the chains of addiction and to overcome and heal the wounds of abuse and hurt and past. He doesn't know. He's never heard the name of Jesus presented in any way that would symbolize that there's a God of love that actually cares about his life. You want to know where Cameron lives? He lives about six blocks away from the Flandreau campus. Where every single Sunday morning we gather behind the walls of our church and we talk about a God who loves and who came to reach and seek and save the lost. And I'm asking, I believe Jesus is asking the question of the rescue church today. Do you see him? Open your eyes and look at the fields. They're ripe onto harvest. Cameron's six blocks away. And you're here. And you come and we get so caught up in complaining and griping about what I'm not getting out of church and how it's not meeting my needs. Do you see him? You want to know where Cameron lives? He lives in Coleman. He's about four blocks away from our Coleman campus. Do you see him? Do you see his little sister? Hey, Deside, do you want to know where Cameron lives? He lives just down the road from the community center where you're gathered this morning. God sees him. But do we? Jesus is asking the question, open your eyes, do you see him? You want to talk about being fulfilled and satisfied? Do the work that I put you here to do. They're all around us. Man, recently God has broken my heart for the Camerons of our community. And if you haven't picked up on it, at this point, Cameron's just a composite story. But I'm telling you, Flandreau and Coleman and Deeside and Peoria, those Camerons are just within reaching distance of our locations right now this morning. Do you see them? Do you care? Do you understand that it's not about what we get out of the deal? It's about us being involved in this season of planting and harvesting. And by the way, that's something Jesus goes on to share. This is really cool, and it's encouraging and a little bit of a bummer at the same time. We'll go to the encouraging. It's all encouraging, actually. Okay, let, let, me, let me see if you caught this. The part where Jesus is saying in that passage of Scripture that one sows and another reaps, or another way of saying it is one plants and another harvests. He's telling his disciples, you are going to get to harvest fruit. Again, spiritually speaking, metaphorically speaking, you are going to get to harvest fruit that you had no part in. Planting. You just get to be involved in the harvest. But then when he goes on to say that one sows and another reaps, there's another teaching here. So there's two, two things I want you to see in this. First of all, in ministry, there are those seasons of harvest where we get to be involved in picking that low-hanging fruit in a community. Anytime we go into a new community and start a campus, we experience that harvest, that initial wave of people who were just waiting for the gospel to come. And then they respond, and it's not because of any seeds we planted. It's Jesus Christ who went ahead of us and died on a cross and gave us his spirit and gave us his church and the work of the church that's gone on. For centuries and centuries, someone has planted seeds, and we get to come along behind it and harvest. And man, those are fun seasons of ministry because it feels like we're doing way better than we probably are even doing in those moments. It feels like momentum, and it's exciting. I love getting to be a part of the harvest, especially when we didn't have to work that hard to plant. It's fun. And Jesus is acknowledging that much. You're going to get to be involved in a harvest that you didn't even plant the seeds for. But there's a backside of that as well. Sometimes you're going to get to be the ones planting the seeds, and you're not going to get to see the harvest. That's kind of a bummer. There's a lot of work in planting, and you don't always see the fruit and the harvest in the planting. 
And so I believe what Jesus is saying to the rescue church this morning is, you know what? Yeah, you're going to go into these new communities and you're going to get that low-hanging ripe fruit and there's always going to be that on some level and that's exciting and that's awesome, praise God. But then you're going to get down into the rocky soil of the hard spiritual ground and you're going to get to be involved faithfully year in and year out of planting the seeds of the gospel in that hard, rocky soil. And so check this out, church. Here's kind of a new perspective. The very best days of our church, some of our greatest impact, we might not even get to see in our lifetime. But it's going to come from the seeds that God used us to plant. It's going to be built on the foundation that God uses us to lay. And it's exciting when we get to be on the harvesting end, but it could very well be that our greatest harvest is coming in our children's generation or our grandchildren's generation. And it's another reminder that it is not about us. It has never been about us. It is always and forever will be about the kingdom of Jesus Christ and to his name and to his glory. The season of planting and harvesting and Jesus is saying, open your eyes, guys. The harvest is out there. i got to keep moving. I want to get done with this, and we've got lunch and everything else to move on to, okay? But, man, this is, guys, this is so good. I'll, I'll go through the next few verses here. Verse 39. I love this statement. Now a bunch of the people from town are out here, right? It says, many of the Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me everything I ever did. So when the Samaritans came to him, they urged him to stay with them, and he stayed two days. Jesus hung out for two days with this group of people. And because of his words, many more became believers. Just briefly, I just want to throw this out there. This woman could have easily thrown up these excuses as to why, well, I'm just a Samaritan. I'm just a woman. I'm just a woman with a shameful past. God could never use me. And what I just read in the book of John is that many Samaritans from that town came to know Christ because of this woman. Because she was a Samaritan, because she was a woman, because she had a shameful past, and because God was there at that moment, at that well, to break down those barriers and bring her the gift of eternal life. He used her to be that link in the chain for so many more people. It's what he wants to do in our lives as well. Next verse, verse 42 says this. They said to the woman, we no longer believe just because of what you said, now we have heard for ourselves, and look at this last phrase. You should underline this. We know that this man really is the Savior of the world. I want you to notice they did not say, hey, now we know that this man is a great prophet. Now we know that this man is a good teacher. And now we recognize that this Jesus of Nazareth is a really good historical figure who had some good stuff to say for the self-help industry that if we follow some of his teachings, the world will be a little better place and we can all link arms and sing Kumbaya. That's not what they said about Jesus. They saw him and recognized him as the Savior. And I just want you to come face to face with the implications of what that means. The fact that Jesus is the Savior implies that we are people in need of salvation. That we are people that are trapped in sin and in the bondage of wickedness and evil and brokenness. And Jesus Christ came to this earth as the liberating Savior, the chain breaker to break the bondage of sin and to set us free. We needed to be rescued. And Jesus came as our Savior. And not only just to save us, he came to offer us this satisfying, fulfilling, nourishing food and living water that when we come alive to a relationship with him and walking in the purpose for which we were made, we get satisfied on a level we never thought possible. Here's my question today. Here's my challenge today. Do you know Christ Jesus as your Savior? My prayer is that maybe today some of you, your perspective for the first time will shift to something that's always been there, but now you're seeing it from a new angle. The fact that you are a sinful person in need of a Savior, and the fact that there's a God in heaven who did something about that need. And today he offers a relationship with you through Jesus Christ. 
As I close in a word of prayer, I want to challenge you to receive Jesus as your Lord, as your Savior, as your authority, as your King today. No more waiting, no more excuses, no more stalling, no more pushing him away. Today is the day of salvation. And finally, for the believers in the sound of my voice, my prayer is that your perspective today would be maybe for the first time, maybe just a fresh new look for the first time in a long time that you would look out onto the fields that are ripe onto harvest. The harvest is not four months away. The harvest is now. And there's all kinds of little Camerons and his brothers and his sisters and his moms and his dads and their boyfriends and all of that. They're out there in Flandreau right now, today, in Coleman, today, in Peoria, in Deeside, and they're in need of a Savior. You want to be fulfilled? You want nourishment and satisfaction? Do the work that Jesus Christ has put you here to do. Let's look to the Lord in a word of prayer together this morning. God in heaven, I thank you for this day and I thank you for this time. Thank you for a shift in perspective, Lord. Sometimes we just get stuck in our little rut and we forget to see our world through the lens of Christ, through the eyes of Christ. Lord, I pray right now if I'm speaking to someone here that, that came to the Rescue Church today without a relationship with you, empty, unfulfilled, unsatisfied, lacking peace, lacking power, lacking happiness. Lord, I pray that they would recognize you are the source of life, living water, food that will truly satisfy beyond the ability of human physical food. And I pray that right now in this moment they would turn to you in faith and receive you as their Savior. And God, I believe I speak on behalf of a group of people in this church, those of us who know you and love you and truly do desire to follow you, Lord. We, we live in a world that is so full of distractions and so many things pulling at our attention that, God, we admit, I confess, we so often overlook the little Camerons in our communities who are in desperate need of your love and your salvation. And there is not a government program on this planet that will meet the longing of their hearts in a way that the gospel of Jesus delivered through the body of Christ can do. So God, would you give us a fresh perspective today? Would you get our eyes off of our own selves and our own desires and our own wants? Forgive us. Help us to repent of all of that. And help us shift our perspective to the fields that are ripe for harvest right now. And God, I pray for a great harvest in the days ahead in the life of this church. We give you in advance all the glory and the honor for how you're going to answer this prayer, Jesus. We love you. It's in your name we pray these things. Amen. Thanks for tuning in to the Rescue Church Past Messages. To hear our messages live, head to one of our physical campuses or check out our iCampus at therescuechurch.tv every Sunday at 10 a.m.